Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So on to pumpkin number two in my little mini pumpkin series. The first one I did was by an acrylic pour, which that was so interesting and fun to say the least. Um, hope you were able to check that video out. Um, it was uh, definitely a challenge. And this one for pumpkin number two is going to be yet another challenge for me. I'm going to take on another or different type of art medium, which is watercolor and or gouache. I've done some work in some watercolor gouache before, there's not a whole lot of it, which is why it's another challenge for me because I've, it's nothing I've been consistent with. Um, so yeah, let's see how that goes. But for the composition, as far as that goes, I would like to go back and revisit the buffalo check plaid background or design and then maybe add some like wreath type looking um, decoration or something to be added with the pumpkin just so it looks extra fall-y festive -y type of thing um, which I think is another challenge for me because I'm not really you know great with the greenery and all that kind of stuff but it, I can't help myself I said I really want to challenge so darn it I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge myself <laughs> and so again hopefully that turns out halfway decent but the most important thing is to just have fun I'm really in this just to have fun and I want to share my experience with you um, I did a video similar to this one about two years ago now or so when I first started my channel and I did a painting where I had buffalo check plaid in the background and a pumpkin and so far it looks like everybody had some really positive feedback about it and I'm so grateful you took the time to watch that if you did see that and for taking the time to watch this video um, as well. I wanted to revisit it because I thought looking back at it I'm like you know what maybe I could have done this or that a little bit differently or better. I mean, you know how we are, we're our own worst critics. So for the fact that you enjoyed it, I'm super happy. Um, but like I said, I just wanted to go back and see what I could do as far as making any tweaks and feeling just a little bit better about it. Anyway, before we get started, today's ministry snack, which I think you're gonna like this one. Seriously, I think you're gonna like this one. But it's gonna come from chapters 35 verses four through 19. And then I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and read from verses 29 to 35 and then spilling right over into chapter 36 verse 1. Um, I just took some of it out for the sake of time and because a lot of it is just kind of repetitive so you're welcome. <laughs> Anyways it reads, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twin and linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hooks and its frames, its bars, its pillars and its bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps, and the oil for the light and the altar of incense with its poles and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, and the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grating bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stands, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pigs of the tabernacle and the pigs of the court and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. All of the men and women, the people of Israel, whose heart moved them to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done, brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Asimach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled with him skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twin and linen, or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in any of the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. 
Okay, so this was the time where the people of Israel were on their way out of Egypt and on their way to the promised land. And since it wasn't going to, you know, just be some little hop, skip and jump over there, it wasn't going to be a little short trip. God wanted to have some sort of temporary sanctuary or dwelling place where he would willingly reside his holy presence during their time of travel. Now, the fact that he led his people by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night wasn't just so that his people would have a physical guide leading them where to go, but it was also to serve as a reminder to them that he never left his people just as he would never leave us. Um, I mean, well, if you want him to leave you alone, he will definitely honor that. He That's the one thing I love about um, God as he gives us free will and honors whatever choice that we decide to make. Um, it's not a very good choice if you want him to leave you alone, but that said, just keep in mind that they would always see him with those pillar forms and other forms that he took on, including the place of dwelling that he wanted made. And I love that. That is a great reminder to let us know too that we will always see God present in many different ways as well. But all that aside, what is happening now is that this specific um, dwelling place was to be called the tent of meeting or more specifically the tabernacle. So the making of the tabernacle was just mind boggling just intense and super intriguing to say the least. It was literally, it is literally like reading God's artistic mind and seeing his visual plans on paper to top it off. I mean, it's it's so awesome, um, which if you want to read all about it, it goes into great length and details in the book of Exodus, which is in the Old Testament, um, chapters 35 to 40, I think. But it was to be made with precision, perfection, accuracy and excellency reflecting the very way that he made us now knowing that we are not him um, god was not going to expect you know flawed and broken people to come up with everything on their own all the way down to you know layouts architecture and supplies to name a few especially because it wasn't just a few little things you know he was going to give them the how to's and where to's just because he just wants everything to go according to his will and plan. So that's his grace right there because there was no room for mistakes. And he wasn't going to set his people up for failure either, you know, where mistakes would happen because our God is a fair and just God. Because if they did make mistakes, that was going to basically be on them from being careless and or doubtful. Therefore, again, like I said, he extends his grace and assisting with everything that he knows his people needs as he does for us. And he did that to make sure everything was done right the first time around, which makes sense. I mean, why do anything redundantly? You know what I mean? But you know what he also called for to make it all happen? Artists. That's right. Craftsmen, tradesmen, and artists of all kinds. So in other words, people of skill in all areas because each skill is equally important. So let me say that again. Art is important. And as you know, art comes in all kinds of forms. But when God created us, he artfully created us to be equally special and wants us to have a sense of fulfillment in our lives. Most importantly, being fulfilled by the Holy Spirit, but also being fulfilled and utilizing our gifted talents and skill sets. I'm in several Bible classes, and in this one class, I'm reading a book called The Creative Calling by Janice Elsheimer. And I will provide the link in the description for you if you'd like to check it out yourself. But it is it is so amazing, very eye-opening and thought-provoking. And I am not really a reader, but this book it has been a treat. It is really just, like I said, eye-opening and thought-provoking. Um, so the fact that I'm enjoying it, I hope that you will too, especially if you're not a reader. And this is coming from a non-reader. Um, let me share a few things that I highlighted that I really think will strike a chord with you too, the way they did for me. Uh, so she says, our gifts are not from God to us, but from God through us to the world. When we fail to use these gifts, we suffer the same way a person accustomed to regular physical activity may feel pent up, out of sorts, and off balance after going for several days without exercise. She continues to say, if we have neglected to develop and use the talents God has given us, Listen to this. We feel incomplete, unfulfilled, unfinished, even depressed. Does that not sound like, I mean, for me at least, if I'm not doing what I feel I have a desire to do, which is art, I feel one or all of these things. So that she continues to say, we engage in diversions of all kinds in attempt to find that elusive thing called fulfillment. We spend our time and money in a fruitless search to, quote, find ourselves, unquote, 
instead of finding out how God wants us to use the talents he has given us. The last thing I highlighted is that she says, that's what this book is about. No matter how busy, overworked, or under pressure you may be, if you have a sincere desire to use the gifts God has given you, and if you are willing to do your part, God will be faithful to do his. Is that not like a wow factor right there? Is that not just like jaw dropping and heart feeling for you guys? That, that literally is for me. The bottom line is our gifts are to be used that would bring honor and glory and to serve God and advance his kingdom. It's just unfortunate that many of us have instead used our gifts to glorify ourselves, hoard any money that we can get out of our gifts and live a very prideful life, uh, not even thinking about where our gifts came from or the purpose of why we have them. I mean, I hate to say this, but been there, done that. Now let pride serve as a warning that that is a sure ticket into hell if we cannot dump that junk from our heart. So for anyone who didn't know, which I think most of us already knew or know, that uh, Satan, who was formerly known as Lucifer, being an angel in heaven, one of the highest authority angels in heaven, was cast down into hell simply because of having pride. So look what that got him. Doesn't mean it's gonna be any different for us. We're gonna have the same outcome, like I said, if we can't dump that junk. Now, sure, we will totally get better with practice um, and training in our talents, but think of the people who have that natural talent, you know, that never went to school. I never went to school, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught. I observe other people just as you do. I do things by trial and error and so on because the desire is there to do what was planted in my heart and to keep going. Now, I always knew I had a desire but I didn't always know I had a gift and a purpose, at least not until I was saved, hence the been there, done that. Uh, honestly, even on occasion after being saved, so always ask the Holy Spirit to keep your heart and your motives in check. Anyway, I'm not bound to drawing just stick figures and two dimensional objects or pictures type thing, or as other people are, at least at this point in their life. And I say that because they may not be able to draw a stick figure to save their life, but man, can they sing or sculpt this stunning garden like a boss, you know, and they never took any, you know, lessons or went to school or had professional classes either. That talent just magically appeared by God's grace, which is his obvious desire to give each and every one of us special, unique talents and gifts that collectively, no matter what they are, bring him glory. So that could be anywhere from singing, playing music, writing music, writing poetry, painting, drawing, woodworking, architecture, embroidery, welding, dancing, culinary arts, martial arts, gardening, interior design. I mean, obviously I can go on, um, but together these gifts paint more of a picture about the glory of God and who he is and how we can bless the world through the gifts he has given us. Just like when we live a life the way Jesus did, others have a better understanding who he is without us even using words all while blessing people at the same time. Now, I'm not saying I'm the best artist out there or I just woke up like this, you know. Shoot, I can see how far I've come when I started this channel two years ago now, I think. Um, anyways, but even my knowledge of God's word is night and day. But God gave me a gift and I'm to use it according to his will and purpose. Remember, it is always about thy will, not my will. That means keep it active, practice, keep our pride in check, and to get better to where he wants us to be, including studying his word, which is actually for all of us to do all the time. So as long as I'm using art and sharing his word for his glory and to bless anyone I can, because I want to at any opportunity that arises, he will make me better and better, just like any artist or person with skill. Even if they're already, you know, really good, they simply get better over time by his grace. Now, if you feel like you just have no talent whatsoever and that God just sort of skipped over you, that's where I want to be encouraging to you to try to connect or reconnect with God so that he may reveal your gifts because you have one, maybe even many, or they may not even be what you thought they would be. Either way, they may start off with just a desire. Therefore, he would grow that desire into something like, you know, some sort of like an action plan that would ultimately reveal his blessings and gifts that he's given you, hoping that you're going to use them to glorify him while also blessing other people. So for the making of the tabernacle, God commanded Moses to tell his people what he wanted, 
which was just a contribution to help make it and their willingness to use their skills and their gifts. So take note that he commanded the communication aspect of it, not that everyone hand over everything they have, just specific things and if they were willing, just like the Holy Spirit wants us to glorify him through all that we have and can do if we're willing. He emphasized that whoever had a generous heart to give what they had that happens to be on his list that could help erect this tent of meeting, which as you heard, included a ton of things, things that we would think are totally you know, random and odd, you know, but because God is the ultimate artist, he knew what he needed to make something that's beyond impressive, but not to rub into anyone's face, to be prideful. God doesn't need anyone's approval or need to impress anyone because he is God. He just sets the tone that he doesn't make anything, you know, lazily, without desire, uh, cutting corners or half ass, so to speak, pardon my pun, something that we all probably do more often than we'd like to admit, myself included. Um, but so if anyone was going to contribute to the making of it, rather if it was through their supplies or time or skills with any kind of grudging or complaining, he wanted nothing to do with those people um, or the things that they would rather cling on to. So that means if we're going to grudge about giving him, you know, our money, time, things, even our service, then he doesn't want anything to do with us in that matter because he only wants um, people to reflect the same heart that he has for us. He wants nothing on a one-sided basis. Even if there's pressure involved, he wants nothing to do with us in that manner. And that, that makes sense too. I mean, I wouldn't want that. So my guess is neither would you, <laughs> but shoot, here's the opposite. Don't just go and over give either as in don't just go and give in order to be noticed by others on how generous you are. You know what I mean? So not only are you not giving with a genuine heart, but you're really just trying, well, in a case like that, one would really just be seeking attention for the wrong reasons. A message I recently did about doing things in secrecy when I was doing an acrylic pumpkin pour painting. So like I said, not only is it not being genuine, but it's also not helping anybody by potentially making them feel bad. So what I mean is here, a genuine giver could be giving everything that they have, but looking at you, not actually giving with a genuine heart can make them feel like they can never measure up. So do not be prideful because again, that pride cannot just be harmful to you, but it could also hurt others. Everything must be a 100% match to God's will and purpose the way his will and purpose is for us. So think of a lot of 401k plans. You know, most people take um, up that offer because their company typically matches what they put in it. Well, God works in a similar fashion. You know, we show him 100% love, willingness, and generosity. He's gonna match that and then some because he is our overachiever when it comes to showing his love for us. And don't mix it up with him being prideful. He is our overachiever simply because for the fact that he loves us. You don't even wanna know how much I spoil my son when I don't have to, you know? I do it just because I can and I love him so much, especially when he is good and obedient. Again, the same thing with God. He does it because he can and because he loves us so much, especially when we're good and obedient to him. But listen to this. If we're feeling off about our giving under any circumstance, he would rather that we pull the honesty card and say, you know, I'm just really not in the mood. Um, and he'd be more happy with that because at least we were honest, which means a lot more to him than doing anything out of obligation or pressure and grudging in the process. So just know if we pull the I'm not in the mood card all the time, then think about your heavenly 401k plan, figuratively speaking, because if our heart isn't to live for Jesus, which is all about giving anyway, then we really don't have any kind of heavenly plan going on for us. Instead, we have a horrible spiritual debt plan instead, you know, suffering for eternity in payment for all the iniquities that we've ever done over our entire life. And trust me when I say God knows every single one, even the ones that you wouldn't think are iniquities would be an iniquity in his eyes. So talk about what an awesome sense of memory and knowledge because I can hardly remember what I even wore yesterday. So there's no such thing as sinning in secret. You can't hide anything, not even your thoughts because God knows it all. And so you better fess up, you better fess up real fast if you haven't already. Just, you know, take ownership and repent. It just means have a change of heart, clean up your act and do it with a genuine sense of genuineness, you know? That said, my advice is to just get right with Jesus and think about your heavenly 
protection plan, you know, because it is everlasting and non-corruptible. But back to scripture, like Bezalel and Oholiab and how God put skill and intelligence in them to do any work, God will do the same for you when you desire to use your skill set for him. But real quick though, it's important to note that on the other hand, if you feel like you already have this super awesome skill set, you know, and you're just totally fine not having a speck of a relationship with him, that you've got your skill set all on your own, unfortunately, that is having a very prideful mindset. That's basically saying, I don't need God, I'm just fine without him. And it's basically saying you're right up there with him, you know, just way up there and God will not be mocked. A quick noteworthy side story is that my son had to learn the Bible verse in school, Galatians chapter six, verse seven, which is written by the apostle Paul who wrote a letter to the Galatians, warning them in this part of the letter saying, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So in other words, do not be deceived thinking you acquired your skill set all on your own. Everything is by God's willing and or allowing. So thinking otherwise is ultimately mocking him and you'll unfortunately and eventually reap what you sow. So just be responsible with your thoughts, words, and actions. You know, just take ownership, take responsibility. And I love that because that is so applicable for everyday life, you know, and for all ages as is everything in the Bible. So as I move on closer to the painting already, just remember where our talents and our gifts came from and why we even have them. And it's not unheard of to be multi-talented either, you guys. It, our main gift in life is the gift of our salvation, but God does give us many gifts in life. But don't think that the resources that he gives us in order to carry out our gifts and the talents aren't blessings too, because you better believe that they are. The book of Job chapter one, verse 21 is a great reminder as it says, naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord have gave and the Lord have taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So just think at any time he can take away what he's given. So always be thankful. Plus our focus should always be on him and not our gifts. And no, no one actually returns to their mother's womb, but they will go wherever they go, heaven or hell, naked. That's right, no Dolce Cabana glasses, no Jimmy Choo shoes, no Louis Vuitton bags, you know, no Vera Wang dresses. You will be naked. Only in heaven there's no shame or embarrassment about it. But what I want you to take away from all of this, among other things, um, is if you are too afraid to put your God-given talents to use, brethren, may I remind you that you are letting the enemy take control of your thoughts because he does not want you to glorify God. He does not want you to be a blessing to other people. He does not want you to succeed. He does not want you to get better at anything. He wants you to constantly see yourself as not good enough. He wants you to believe when other people think that you won't make any real money out of whatever you have a desire in doing, you know, he wants you to stay doubtful and immobile on all accounts. And he certainly doesn't want you to pray about anything. And so let me help be encouraging to you and remind you that the Bible says art is important. That's right. It's not a waste of time. It's not useless. It's not being lazy. It's not what so many people like to slap a negative label on about, you know, God commands his people to put their gifts to use as long as their heart is in it for him. You guys, the Bible was not just meant for the people back then. It was noted for our history and for us to apply now and always. That said, it is then will God use us. We just have to empty ourselves from ourselves. Um, because if we don't empty ourselves, we're essentially full of ourselves, which therefore really is defining us as spiritually empty, if I'm making sense. But anyways, you may not be world renowned, just like I'm not exactly world renowned, you know, but God is using me. And the fact that our almighty God is using me and sees that I'm good enough to bring him glory, you know, the same way that he sees you as good enough to bring him glory. That's awesome. You know, and the fact that I can be a blessing uh, to someone with just a small piece of my work that I wouldn't think would be a blessing, but in someone else's eyes, it is a blessing. Just how your work could be a blessing again more awesomeness. Keep this in mind that when God created us, he said back in the book of Genesis chapter one, verse 31, and God saw what he made and behold, it was very good. So not only does he see that we're good because hello, we're perfectly made in his image, but anything we make for him will always be good in 
his eyes. So he's the only one we should really care about who thinks anything of what we make anyway. Don't be shy to use your artistic gifts or any gifts. Use them. God is calling you to use them, beginner or advanced. Use them. Again, don't bury them. Don't hide them. God knows what you will be. So anyone encouraging you or telling you to avoid spending time using your gifts, the gifts that bring you a sense of fulfillment and enjoyment the way he meant for you to have and feel because they think it's a waste of time or not good enough to pursue in life is essentially them playing God with their all-knowing mindset. Again, another form of pride. God will reveal his plans for you in prayer. If you have no resources now to pursue your gifts and talents or to continue to pursue them, pray about that too. Listen to what his plans are for you and how you are to execute your given desires and gifts. He will not shortchange you. They will be more glorious than you can ever realize. So don't shortchange his ability to get you going or going again if you've turned away. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm starting off using my T ruler to mark the middle of my 11 by 14 watercolor flat panel canvas, both vertically and horizontally. You'll see I mark both ends too, so it's less likely that I apply my tape unevenly. Next, I put down my first piece of tape in the middle, which I'm using one and a half inch painter's tape, although you could use whatever tape you have on hand or whatever size you want. And then you'll see that I measure it to make sure that the space on the top and the bottom is equal, in which it wasn't, so I had to readjust it. I should have measured on both sides, honestly, but I didn't, so oh well. I guess I, if it comes out uneven, hopefully it won't be noticeable. Now I'm tearing off another piece and lay it right next to the piece I just applied so that the edges are basically kissing. This will be my spacer tape that will be used to make sure each row is spaced evenly apart. Here's a third piece of tape and I lay it down in the same fashion, only now I pull up my spacer strip and put it below the last piece I put down and so on and so forth. From here, I repeat the process on the top half. Both ends should have an equal border or edging exposed. Now that my tape has been applied, I'm using my three quarter inch tip flat brush or wash brush using the color eucalyptus. My paint isn't that runny, but you can make it as thin as you like. Just be aware that the more runny you make it, the paint can bleed under the tape. I'm just going for a good once over look here. Really, I'm not trying to get a perfect crisp look to it. And here, as you can see, I'm painting around my pre-sketched pumpkins, which is important to try not to go over the lines too much. Unlike acrylic paint or oil paint, where you can just cover up any mistakes after it's dried, using watercolor and or gouache, the paint is reworkable. It's water soluble, so it can easily blend with whatever other color you paint over it, uh, therefore potentially creating an entirely different color in that area. But don't fret, everything is fixable. Watercolor is just a bit more tricky, so give yourself some grace if you're not very familiar with watercolor and or gouache paints. Here I'm just making sure my coloring is pretty consistent before I remove the tape, which by the way, keep those strips of tape handy. You'll need them again. Also make sure your paint is dry between each step of the buffalo check pad process. Now I'm gonna repeat the vertical tape application process the same way I did horizontally, starting off in the center, measuring the sides, and spacing accordingly between each piece of tape. Again, I forgot to measure both ends, meaning I forgot to measure the top, so now I'm really hoping it comes out even. Now I'm painting in the vertical lines just like the horizontal. Keep in mind that if you focus on getting an absolute seamless look to it, as in you're trying to perfectly blend everything, it's very likely that you'll lose the squares from the horizontal lines because the paint underneath is being reworked from being water soluble. Therefore, it can be much more difficult to find where to reapply your tape when moving on to the next step. That said, try to paint them in to where you can still see the squares painted before. They should be just a tidbit darker and is why you'll notice that I wasn't thoroughly painting in the squares. This is also because you'll need some sort of visual guideline for the next step in layering your tape. Okay, so you're gonna leave that tape on and get the strips of tape that you have handy to reapply. 
you'll want to reapply the tape to the original horizontal tape line, which should be the rose with the lighter shade or gradient, so only the darker line should be exposed. My suggestion is to use the spacing strip again to ensure even application. If you've completely lost where your original lines were, simply go back to the very first step in applying the tape horizontally. Those are the lines that need to be painted, so you'll have to adjust the tape somehow to where the original tape line is exposed. And of course, before you move on, just make sure your tape is secure and your paint is dry. Now I'm taking some olive green mixed with a little eucalyptus and painting in the exposed squares. Again, you'll see I'm just giving it a quick once over. And now for the reveal. Hey, hey, look at that. I'm a happy girl. Now it's time to paint the pumpkins. So I'm gonna start with the back one first using my number eight round brush, filling it in with the color orange yellow. Now, believe it or not, that little blob of orange paint that you see there in the tray, it's, it's probably less than, I don't know, like a quarter teaspoon or so. That's actually a generous amount of paint. I mean, I'm not even kidding when I say you should even have some left over. Seriously, these paints are mind-blowing. At least I think so because they have fantastic coverage. Anyway, when your brush feels dry, just dip it in some water to keep the paint flowing and pick up any paint as needed, but just a little bit. You'll see as I'm filling it in, I'm keeping my brush strokes contouring the pumpkin. I forgot to mention earlier that this is a semi-transparent paint, so if you use too much water, you'll see more canvas and or have a look that's too runny and dull. You may want to do a quick paint test and get a better idea what these paints are like before jumping into a project using these paints, particularly with the semi-transparent colors, whereas opaque colors, you probably won't come across that issue so much and find your paint going further and more evenly, but that's just a suggestion. As you can probably tell so far that this is pretty vibrant. I love it. I'm glad I didn't choose another shade of orange and that I tried to keep my paint a little thinner along the wedge line so I would still know where they are when I shade them in. So here I'm just going back after it dried and I'm gonna add a little more color to it just to brighten it up a notch. Plus the more paint you add, the more easily you're able to blend. But just because I say that does not mean I'm suggesting to squirt out a bunch of paint. Those little tubes look like that's hardly any paint at all, but like I said earlier, they go a long way. With the same brush, I'm now using raw umber to create the shadowing along the wedge areas. I don't want harsh lines, so you'll see that I spend a good amount of time blending to keep the lines soft looking and to add to the texture of the pumpkin skin.
Now that I have all the shadowing in place, I'm going to add some light apricot for some highlights and color variation, again contouring the shape of the pumpkin to keep it nice and smooth looking. For the stem, I'm still using raw umber and you may notice that I didn't even pick up any paint because what was on my brush, which wasn't much, was sufficient enough to cover the whole thing and add nice detailing to at the base of it. Take note the base sort of flares out and has jagged edging. Oh, and you probably already saw how I accidentally went over the stem line in the pumpkin in the foreground. I am not concerned about it because I'm covering that area with the same color, which is obviously super dark, so it'll cover that real nicely. Onto the foreground pumpkin, my brush is all clean, which it should be between each area anyway, but you want it especially clean if you're using white. And here I'm using titanium white as the base color, which is not easy to see. I mean, white on white, <laughs> it's never easy to see. But anyway, I'm also cleaning up my lines while I'm at it before I get into the coloring. So for the wedge lines, I'm using gray, but again, I spend a lot of time blending because I don't want harsh lines. An easy way to think of how to paint these in is to think of painting a blow up beach ball or a pool ball. Finally, I add some latte brown followed by a little yellow ochre for color variation in the skin texture, but take note they're super light. I mean, it's probably hard enough to see anyways because those colors are only added to add a hint of color, but that's how I like it. You can add as much color as you like to it. The wonderful thing about art is that there's no right or wrong way, just the way that you like it. But again, you'll see how I'm contouring the shape of the pumpkin to keep it smooth looking. These colors are opaque too, so you won't need much. And as you can probably see, those little dots of paint in the tray are basically the tip smeared off and even that's too much paint. Now these are technically watercolor paints and so that said there should be a bigger water to paint ratio anyway.
and now I'm filling in the stem with the same brush, color, and in the same way as the background pumpkin. Oh, and you can easily see just how nicely the raw umber covers up the orange that was spilled over into the stem before. So onto the wreath, I'm still using raw umber, but now I'm using a number one detail brush to draw in the branches around each side of the pumpkin. Next, I take my large round brush, dip it in water, lightly pick up some deep green, and I make sure that the whole brush is pretty saturated. Now hear this, if you have too much water on your brush, your leaves will be super transparent and can even be runny looking. And if it's lacking water, it's likely you won't get but a couple of leaves or so that might also look rather rough than smooth. So the object is to get several clean or sharp looking leaves with ease. I know it's hard to see here, but what I'm doing is lightly touching the tip of my brush on the canvas, gradually pressing it down and then slowly releasing to get a pointed edge on both sides of the leaves, in which I'll provide a separate clip of me doing an up close example for you so you can get a better idea. Anyways, you can see I basically go down the line and you could keep it simple with just a few leaves or you can fill it out as much as you'd like, whatever you're most comfortable with or whatever you wanna do. I'll be honest, my intention was to keep it simple because I'm not very experienced in making wreaths and leaves and really just very, I'm not very experienced with watercolor in general. Um, I've done it a few times and really enjoy it, hence why I'm doing it again here. Um, but anyways, obviously I didn't end up keeping it simple. I got carried away in a good way because I was especially enjoying this part of the painting. It felt both fun and therapeutic, just making leaves. I mean, I feel both when it comes to painting in general, but these leaves and details, <laughs> wow. I'm thinking I was prompted by the Holy Spirit because in the end, I absolutely love it. So I have him to thank for pushing me to go outside of my comfort zone yet again, and to focus on the piece, not the skill level. But however you wanna do yours is all that matters. Back to my number one brush using more raw umber, I'm drawing in several more branches for some more different leaves. So here I'm going to repeat the same process for these leaves, only now I'm going to use my number 8 brown brush and switch to a metallic red copper for color variation and to add some accent details as well. You'll see that I paint several up front and then I add some randomly throughout the greenery.
Next, I'm gonna add a few different leaves to add some more variety within my fall wreath. And I'm still using my same brush, but now I switch to a yellow ochre and try to make little oak leaves. I basically draw a straight line down and then dab my brush sideways three times on each side to get the little curves in it. Again, I'll put another clip of me up close so you can have a better idea. Here I'm just adding a little bit of orange yellow back into the yellow ochre so that the leaves look more two-toned. You'll notice I just do a quick once over because I'm going more for a suggestion of a two-toned look rather than precision since these leaves are rather small. Next I return to my number one detail brush to do one last little detail to my oak leaves which is to paint in the vein lines using more raw umber. And lastly, I use my number eight round brush to add one more color of leaves within the wreath, which is a sage green to help make it look fuller and look more balanced with all the other colors. Oh wow, how cool is that? It feels so festive, I love it. I especially love how the lighting is picking up on the red copper and the silver. As you can see, I wrote a little reminder to myself that I am blessed and you are too. And you can write anything you want or just leave it blank. I thought it was a nice way to balance out the composition since it's pretty heavy on the bottom. And I also love how the white frame keeps the painting super bright. Lastly, I wanted to start sharing with you a little prayer that I came across in one of my Bible study groups called The Creative Calling, and it struck a chord with me. And so I hope you enjoy it as it will be a consistent prayer I pray with you. So whenever you feel up to doing this project or any project, you have the feeling of the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct your head, heart, and your hands. As it reads, I believe my talents are a gift from God, and I am to use them to fulfill His purposes in my life and in His world. I humbly acknowledge and accept my gifts as I ask to receive God's vision for how I am to use them. I ask the Holy Spirit to free me from self-doubt and self-absorption. I pray this work will bring me into closer alignment with God's plan for me as I seek to bring my gifts and talents into His light and to become the whole and complete person He intends me to be. Amen. Okay, so that concludes this demo. All my paints and supplies are listed in the description as usual. And if you liked this, please do me a favor, share it as well as hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps me out as it shows your support in which I so much appreciate. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.